We're back to the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment on the Toll Education Network, tolltutor.net for more information. Twitter, Toll Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook. I miss doing live radio. I wish we could just put it all together, but again, no radio station has the ability to take the, my professional recording and get it out there anytime I want to do it. Someday technology will have that where it's the greatest sound quality in the world but again i just keep it rocking today i had some awesome miami book fair authors i had biggest loser contestants now it's time for a gold medalist so i'm gonna welcome the program gold medalist for the 1976 olympics celebrity wendy bolio wendy thanks for calling Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Neil. Absolutely. And I tell you, it's, it's going to be an interesting conversation, especially uh, the Olympics have changed since 1976. Wouldn't you agree? That was a different time. I would totally agree. Very, very different. Um, certainly back then it was the state of the art, but as you can see, as the years go on, it, it has changed in a variety of ways from, from the, the amount of money that is, that is in and around the Olympic Games to the athletes to the venues. Um, it, it just goes on. But it, in technology, which is all really great things, not bad things, all great things. Exactly. And, and technology is the greatest thing because you can connect with people all over the world and with just one message you end up having them on your radio show, which is the most awesome thing in the world. But let's go now, because I definitely want to jump into that 76 thing, because, again, we're talking time in the Cold War and all these different things. But let's go mm-hmm. specifically enough to, did you always want to be a swimmer? Oh, always. I'm one of seven children. I grew up in uh, Wisconsin. My parents were, were my coaches until I was 18 years old. My father knew nothing at all about swimming but read everything, and my mother had been a competitive swimmer. So from the time that we were little, we were, we were going to swim because in Land O'Lakes, Wisconsin, there were only about 400 people in the town and not much more, you know, 50 years later. Um, so it was an avenue certainly that my mother was excited about. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty tall. I'm six feet tall and I'm one of the shorter ones, uh, of my siblings. So I think they looked at us as, God, what a great opportunity. They're big and strong. I can do this. We can do this. And, and so I just dreamed big because they place those dreams in our heads. Well, absolutely. And you got to dream big. And that's so so important in certain ways. So basically, being in a family of swimmers, and it wasn't difficult to, to be disciplined and understand this because of your family helping you. Oh, absolutely. My, both my parents were very, yeah, they were just so, they were just so great, um, in how they, how they coached us, but how they were parents. I'm so fortunate because they were honestly, Neil, they were just ordinary, hardworking Midwestern people that just became extraordinary parents and extraordinary coaches. And a lot of that is truly is belief and, and the belief system that they gave to each one of us kids. Absolutely. And did any of your other siblings do as well in swimming as you or close to it? Pretty close. My youngest sister, although not an Olympian, um, was a Pan Am gold medalist, American and world record holder in swimming in the 1983 Pan Am Games. 84 came along, and she was very sick and did not make the Olympic team in 1984. But, um, yeah, so my folks did well, I think. Well, absolutely. So the the training process in your household, especially you said seven, and I, I'm getting close, Wendy. I don't know if I'll ever get to seven kids. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll... Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> so don't do it because the household must have been crazy, wasn't it? It was fun, though. I mean, someone was always doing something, and what one didn't think of, the other one did. There were two boys, five girls. I'm the second youngest, so you can imagine uh, what they dragged me through. Um, so, yeah, my advice, don't go for seven, Neil. Oh, well, I want to go for seven, but my wife doesn't. So we'll find out. who. <laughs> we'll have to stay in touch to find out what happens. Yes. But, but growing up in that uh, l- large of a household, then you got them all involved in activities. How did your parents do this? I mean, just think you, you two, know, how many of them were involved in, in ath- athletics? All, all of us. Oh, we had gosh. to be. We all had to be involved in a sport. We could um, be in the sport, but you had to stick it out through the year. And if you continued to like it, um, yeah, you just kept at it. What's interesting with, with my younger sister, Lori, and I, and, and certainly the town I grew up in, we didn't, the closest 
25 yard pool from us was an hour and a half away. So I trained, my mother was um, a lifeguard at this Gateway Hotel. I trained, as my sister did, in a 17 yard long pool. So it took seven laps to make 100 meters. And that was just in the winter time. In the summer, that hotel was very busy. And so my father and mom had um, put us in a lake near our home, about a mile from our home, put in lane lines, starting block, and that's where we trained every summer. And we did that for, you know, 16 years. So I was not the conventional, oh, put them in the water, you're training with a whole group of, of great athletes, which makes you better. I trained with my younger sister, and uh, we both excelled. So to me, that just launched the trajectory, really a trajectory for things in my life, because if you can do things like that, you can really do anything in your life. Exactly. So your parents were so behind you. But again, I can imagine, see, I'm seeing this Wendy from firsthand having four kids right now and just how, mm-hmm. how I can get anything accomplished. I can imagine that the, you guys are all living in activities back and forth, mom and dad pulled every direction possible then especially well, when we you... learned to be organized you know ah. you, you have to be organized my parents were very organized and uh, we learned that um, through swimming through sports uh, I have a sister and brother that both played uh, other sisters and brothers who played sports and musical instruments so you, you know and it helped in school because in order for me to be able to practice twice a day, 4.30 in the morning for an hour and a half, and then again 4.30 in the afternoon after school an hour and a half, you had to get your homework done. You had to be, you had to be part of the family. You had your chores to do. Growing up in Wisconsin, it was a farm area. Uh, you had to be on task, and that has benefited me in my life uh, ten times over as well as what my children, I've passed on to my children in that way. Okay, we're talking to Wendy Bolio, uh, gold medalist from the 1976 Olympics swimmer. And at this point in time, you're going through, you guys are all pulled in so many directions. Is I guess, Wendy, you learn to be structured and organized because you would fall behind in that house if you didn't. When you finally <laughs> saw that you were going to be competitive in swimming, what age were you when you saw this is going to be something I can do for a long time to come? Uh, I was probably around 10 and up until then my parents were gently gently coached pushed um not to the degree anywhere near the degree of of how coaches push their kids over the years i mean i was really fortunate because they were there was that very there was a very distinct difference between a parent and a coach and my parents found that and i don't know how but they found it but once i once I recognized success and once I realized I'm pretty good at this, I was about 10 or 11. And then there wasn't any more, gee, Wendy, you got to swim at 430. It was, <laughs> I want to be there at 430. Oh, my gosh. You, you So 10 years old, you were motivated to get up at four, to be at the, the swimming at 430. Wow. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Because I wanted to be, you know, Swimming World magazine just started coming out in, the, in 1959. So I was like four or five years old, and my mother subscribed to that swimming magazine. So I would pour over that. I didn't even know how to read. And I remember going through that magazine, looking at the stars back then of the Donna De Veronas and, and Don Scholanders and all of these, Johnny Weissmiller, Duke Kahana Moko. I'm like, I want to be that. And so I just, I just worked at that in this little tiny pool. My father was an engineer, so he devised this system that went around my waist, this like pulley system. <laughs> the belt went around my waist, up to the top of the pool, over to the side, down the side, and he would plate load it so I could swim in place. And that's how I would train in the winter to get long distance swimming. I mean, my father made my pace clock, he made the lane lines, he made the starting block. I mean, they were very engaged, very encouraging, and gave me all the opportunities that they felt were necessary. And it didn't mean being on the coast of California swimming with the big swimming teams. It meant you take the opportunity. It's here. Let's do the best that we can right here with the goal of of going on to college and making the Olympic team when I was older, which is what I did. Well, Wendy, last week I had Michael Weiss on the program, and he talked about the sacrifice of Olympians, okay, and how that Mm -hmm. they had the parents just had to drain a lot of finances involved in this. So you didn't go somewhere else, Wendy. You stayed swimming in your area. You didn't, you, you know, like you hear about all these uh, gymnasts who have to move somewhere else. So basically, well, different time, different era. 
too, yeah. remember? Yeah. I mean, yes. swimmer certainly, um, being from Wisconsin, you think of, of skiers and, and skaters and, and, you know, that, that type of athlete back then and even today. But my parents were my coaches, and we had what we had. And my parents, my dad was an electrical engineer at this hotel as well. So my dad was making $1.90 an hour and feeding seven kids. So there wasn't money, even if I wanted to go south or out west to train. There wasn't anything available in that way back then. And you know what? I think the biggest reason my younger sister and I succeeded so well and did so well was they knew us so well. Where another coach, it's it's not the same. Not that you can't have success, because certainly people do. But my parents knew when to to push it when to back off. And that comes from being a parent and very, very involved 24-7, which is what, which is what they were as parents so, as well. So, Wendy, at 10 years old, you, did, you, did you already say, I'm going to the Olympics and I'm going to be a gold medalist? That was your goal oh, yeah. at 10? Oh, my God. See, there, there <laughs> oh you go. God, so, yeah. there, 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 there you go. That, that, that just proves, again, for our listeners out there, especially with children, that uh, you're competing saying, I want to be the very best. You see these uh, parents now pushing their kids. You really need to have the kid intrinsically motivated in your opinion, Wendy, to be successful. Yeah. You can't have him just yeah. dragging him to the pool or dragging him to oh, the God, basketball no. court or dragging him on the football field and think, hey, they're going to get no. it. I talk they to burn someone, out, they're done, they're, they're 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 done by 16, which happens today. I mean, it's, you know, very few people, people just, I think, Neil, really don't get young parents, and, and even back then, that, look, it's a small percentage of people that make the NFL. It's a small percentage of people that, that make, you know, the NBA and, and Major League Baseball. You know, someone told me, John Neighbor, Olympian, four-time Olympian, had gotten this statistic, one in 666,000 people, one in that number, will make an Olympic team. One in 22 million will actually win an Olympic gold medal. So the odds are like, your odds are better getting hit by lightning than making an Olympic team. And, And as long as you recognize that... I think with kids, and I was really fortunate, they gave, look, I was talented, I worked hard, I was very disciplined, but talent and, and DNA have a lot to do with it. Um, now, that being said, um, sometimes kids just need that extra little push, and, and some parents do that and do it wonderfully, and some coaches do it wonderfully, but for the most part, it's not done that way. Okay, when we get back, more of Wendy Bolio, and we're going to go really into uh, specifically one more thing, the experience in the Olympics. I'm going to kind of, my questions, as you'll see, I'm really interested in the education portion of it and the family portion of it because I have a big family. And as an educator and a teacher and owning a tutoring consulting company, Wendy, I want to talk to these families that think they have the next superstar athlete. And I talk about it, and maybe I'll do talks someday to families saying, I'm the one that, who do you know, Wendy, out there that have interviewed gold medalists? Uh, Super Bowl champions, Mm -hmm. NHL Mm -hmm. champions, all different champions of all different genres and how they made it into those sports so that parents truly see this has got to be a dedication of the child, not just the parents. You're listening to Total Education, uh, Total Tutors Show, powered by the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment, and we'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the Total Education Celebrity Show, powered by the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment. TotalTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, and I'm with Wendy Bolio, and I'm having a tremendous conversation. But I knew when she answered the phone, I was going to have a blast. And I, two segments is not enough time. I think we're going to be great friends, and we're going to stay in touch because, again, I could see her passion and how she is able to take, especially a 1976 Olympic champion. We're not talking 2000, uh, 2000 champion. We're not talking just a couple years ago as Wendy you sound like that that's that's again to be commended uh that you were talking 1956 I was born in 1973 so we're really we're really I will not hold your ignorance against you you, you, Neil you have you have you've you've such you've such drive and enthusiasm so you knew you'd be an Olympic champion you had that drive you kept going so tell us the story specifically finally when it became an underdog story because you never knew about again the Eastern Bloc countries and the Cold War and how they trained a lot different than you, Wendy. Maybe not, but that. that, that oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that basically in '76, well, on blood doping, whatever, all the different things that were happening, you guys didn't have a good shot, even though you made the team, right? 
we did not have a good shot. We, you know, two years before at World Championships, uh, the Eastern Bloc countries, East Germany in particular, were just so strong. And Neil, they weren't they weren't setting world records by a tenth of a second. They were blowing people out of the water all of U.S. summers. And it's the first time, really, since um, since 1952, really, that the United States women swimmers were not expected to win, if not you know half a dozen gold, all 12 or 13 gold. And so we went into Montreal knowing that the Germans were just so fast. Now, look, I've been, I had swam my whole life. I had trained, I had traveled through Europe. I, I mean, I knew the scoop. And yet when you saw these women, you had, you, you seriously, you looked at them and went, say what? Because <laughs> they were, they, they were huge women. And not that there aren't huge women, but there was, the, the muscle on them was, was, Phenomenal! You train your whole life to compete on a playing field that is fair. And, yes, you are always going to have cheaters. But no one really knew that the whole state-sponsored system was going on in East Germany. You kind of thought, ah, there's a few of them. How did they, how did they not get caught when they went through their, uh, their drug testing? Well, the drug testing back in 76 was, was just hardly anything. Hardly anything. So they passed it through. And by the way, a couple didn't make it and were sent home. So they fielded this team. We saw America's Best that first night of United States women swimming on a Monday. Shirley Babishoff, Kim Payton, Jill Sturkle from the 100 free and take fourth, fifth, and seventh place, not by a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second, um, but by full body length. And right then and there, you kind of went, wow, what is going on? Wednesday, I swam the 100 fly, grabbed a bronze medal. And at that time, only Shirley and I had won individual medals. By the time Sunday came, that Sunday, it was the final race, the final night. It was the 4 by 100 freestyle relay of Kim, Shirley, Jill, and myself. And, uh, you know, you, you never really know how much you have left in the tank right. until you're standing there going, oh, my God. And, and you know, luck, God, something happened that night, that final night, that final race. And we beat the East Germans by four seconds. I did a uh, show, um, and it's called Doping for Gold on, on PBS a couple years ago. And I went back to East Germany, what is now Germany now, and did interviews with these women that I competed against. And, you know, we talked about the drugs that were happening at the time. And, and the majority of them said, yes, we had no idea. But there were a few, Petra Tumor, for example, that, that absolutely denied using oh. performance-enhancing drugs. And, you you know, it is and it was back then um, something that you just, you know, you just couldn't even fathom that a whole state would do that. And, you know, you fast forward today and, and drugs in all sports is is there. I mean, you yeah. can't watch. Oh, it's watch. silly. It's, they're all doing it. Silly. Right? Yeah. You just can't sit there and go, God, is that person clean or not? And that's the shame of it all. Um, and it's not every every single athlete, absolutely not. And that, you know, you look at a, a guy like Lance Armstrong who, you know, deceived people for how many years? I mean, it's it's an awful thing. So those do exist. But back in 76, man, that was, uh, we walked away with our only gold medal that year. There were only seven Olympic gold medals by United States women in all disciplines, oh, and we grabbed one of those seven. So it must have been an honor. The, the the shock of winning and you upset it was almost like uh, the eighty Olympics before in, in the hockey. Well, the, 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 so interesting. You know, it's funny, and it's not funny, ha-ha funny, Neil, but we come back from Montreal so excited because we got one gold medal. We were booed by the press. We were <sighs> called sour grapes because no one believed what we were saying going, because we were just really blatant. Look, they're on something. There is just no way they are that much faster, that much bigger, better, stronger. Um, you know, and, and by the way, they're shaving right before they get on the block. Like, there are plenty of tip-offs <laughs> here, but no one bought it. No one believed it. So we took just a lot of crap after Montreal for years and years and years. My husband and I, we had to notify the FBI. I got death threats. I got oh horrendous gosh. mail. It was not a good experience so, oh, at all. Wendy. At all. It, 
it wasn't until the wall came down in 1989 that um, that this all got cleared up and was proved in criminal charges against the coaches and the doctors. I mean, people went to jail over this. It was it was the first time in sports that criminal charges were filed and people went to jail because of what happened to the East German those young women back then who they were kids, Neil. They weren't they weren't. NFL football players, 25, 30, knowing what they're doing. These were 10, 12-year-olds that they pulled into the system oh and, and doped them systematically. It was, it's very sad, and that's what the Doping for Gold um, documentary was about. Well, you know it's still happening probably in China and stuff. Just, just, just saying. Mm-hmm. But more, in, mm-hmm. more, in the, more, more in other games, especially gymnastics and stuff. Mm-hmm. No, no, so Wendy, so basically it kind of reminds me of, of Vindication, the teams that lost to Michigan the years that they were cheating so bad in uh, college basketball 10 mm-hmm. years later. <laughs> but how as an athlete that competed so many times and we're told you're not good enough, then finally are vindicated years later? How did that make you feel? You know, it's it's honestly you just knew. I mean, there was just no way. And and I, and really, because my husband and I, uh, Bernie and I, were married nine months before M- Montreal happened. And Bernie and I are thirty eight years married now. Um, but at that time, we knew we knew that the, the it, so it didn't. Ultimately, it didn't matter, Neil. I mean, I walked away from the Olympics. I was as happy as can be with a gold and a bronze. I had camaraderie with my teammates. I had a sport that I loved. I made the Olympic team. And God, to walk away with a gold. And I didn't need anybody else's to pat me on the back and go, we, we, you know, we're so, we're so glad about that, the, that the wall came down and the proof is out there. I mean, I went on. Bernie and I have three kids. We've got grandkids. I had a life after Montreal because I was one of the oldest. I was 21 married um and they called me mom on the team so i mean i I was i was pretty centered and grounded for sure so it it didn't affect me so life after swimming you got involved in a lot of activities and different stuff did you use the gold medal to your advantage in your career after that you know, I think, um, I, I don't know if it was an advantage. Um, I, I would imagine to some degree it is. But, you know, you still have to have proof in the pudding, right? Um, I opened my eyes to a lot of things. I was in touch and able to be with organizations like the Women's Sports Foundation. That's a very... Um, incredible organization at a very high level of, of top athletes that filter down into the grassroots level programs and be a part of that. Different organizations, but I really found my niche with long-term care financial planning because because my parents were my coaches, my father went through a long-term care situation 31 years ago that really launched me into the profession that I have today as a long-term care uh, specialist. I work with uh, financial advisors all over the country um, on health Helping their clients um, look at long-term care as, look, this is a possibility in our lives. Are you prepared? What is the planning that you need to do for it? Because I'm all about planning and education. And uh, this this has been what my father and family went through was astounding and took us off guard much more than anything else I can imagine. And it's not just, was not just my family. This is happening to millions and millions yes. of people all over the world, and they need to be prepared. Well, Wendy, l- let me... Uh... I, I completely agree with you, and I, I talk to my parents always about make sure that they have long-term insurance, which they do, which is good, because, again, this could drain you completely. And the, the families, the parents, the, I mean, the, the, the grandchildren, the, I mean, the, 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 the children, they have to take care of their parents later on. They're not expecting this. Their kids finally grow up, they go on to college, and this is when it happens. It happens right. at this time where, you know, oh, everything's over. <laughs> the kids are out of the house. And guess what? That doesn't mean anything. For us, it won't be a different story, Wendy. We'll be we'll hang both games because uh, of our large family. But you have to go through so many different things, and you have to understand that the parents sometimes – don't ultimately know what's the best decision for themselves because they're suffering through through things like Alzheimer's or dementia sure. or, or they're, they're suffering in other ways. How do you deal with this and deal with this so we're still taking care of them as great members of society but understand that they, they're becoming more and more like children because of what they're, the, the older they become? Well, certainly Alzheimer's puts, uh, you know, 
puts it in the spotlight. And, and it's interesting because I've been with Genworth Financial now for 16 years. Um, and so Alzheimer's as, as, a, as a claimant, as a person on claim, is, is certainly prevalent when claims come in the door for, for our company, and I would imagine other top companies as well. What we're finding with Alzheimer's, um, I understand you had Lisa Gibbons on the other day or a couple weeks ago, we're finding it in younger and younger people. So this isn't a disease anymore about being 80 and 90. Right. Uh, my mother's 93, so that's a part of her life, and, and as a family member, a part of our lives. But we're seeing it in, in men and women in their 50s um, and 60s. So when people think of long-term care, Neil, I think the biggest misnomer is, oh, that's about being old, so I don't have to think about it now. And my parents really aren't old yet, so I don't have to think about it now. Where I think preparing in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, so and beyond so is what this is about. Because do you, you agree that you have, to have, you have to have something. You have to have some sort of pulse. You cannot literally live without any insurance and be able to handle well, this. Right. When it comes to long-term care financial planning, it, it, the, the interesting thing with insurance is so many people go, oh, I'll wait and get it, or, or I can always get it. You have to be healthy in order to you, buy you, a you, long-term you, care you, insurance you, you, policy. What age would you say when you should buy it? Well, Bernie and I bought ours at 42, and, and I'm 58, and he's 61. So we've had ours 15 years because 43% of people needing long-term care today are under the age of 64. As fit as I am, and I am fit, and I take great care of myself, I'm not immune to a cancer or a disease yes, or getting hit by a bus and not dying. So to me, this is about today. If it happened today, how do I pay for it? Insurance is one way. Family is another way. Are there government programs that are available? Actually, unless you are indigent and poor, that's the only way that the government will pay. And then, obviously, self-pay, which is what people are doing right now at eight or $9,000 a month for care. And that's, that we need to close that gap. And that comes with education and understanding what the cost of care is today and how it continues to go up. Because, Neil, when my dad needed a nursing home 31 years ago, it was $18 a day, and we couldn't afford it. My mother sits in a nursing home in Green Bay, Wisconsin, at 200 and $82 wow. a day. Now, I don't know, at some, I don't care how much money a person has, at some point you cry uncle yeah. and go, oh my God. So being prepared, whether it's family, government, your own money, uh, or a long-term care policy, work with an advisor if you have one. If not, uh, I, I recommend that, or at least a specialist to help you in this area. And then have a written plan. So, again, I'm 40, my wife's 39, you think it should start pretty soon. Go ahead and, and d- 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 well, if you're healthy, the healthier you are, then you have a chance of getting a long-term care insurance policy. And over fifty percent of people um, over the age of fifty-five can't buy an insurance policy because of their health is not is not right. It's like trying to buy fire insurance for your house if smoke is coming out of the window. You just can't get it. So the younger you are, the less expensive a policy is. But I know you're competing, also, Neil, you and your wife, with raising four kids, soon to be five kids, you've got college education, there are priorities um, in your life right now, but certainly start having the conversation, you and your wife, um, and certainly working with an advisor to have a plan at what point. And again, younger, uh, less expensive. And that's the point, and then you have the policy. So, okay, Wendy, where can we find information on you, learn about this? Because I, I find this very important because I keep telling this. I see this in my, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, how my father-in-law is health is deteriorating, and they are assuming they're going to take care of each other, and he ended up being in a nursing home for like four or five days, and I told them 10 years ago to purchase the policy. It was a little too late, but it was, it was uh, advice I offered. So right. where, where can we find info? You know, you can go, certainly I think you start with the cost. And Genworth Financial, they can go to genworthfinancial.com. That's a great one. And there's a cost of care survey because I think it's important people know what the cost is, not only in their area, but beyond. Uh, so you can start looking and seeing what these costs are and how they're going up. Genworth also has their, the Let's Talk campaign, which I think is really, really valuable for families. How to start that conversation with siblings, with your loved ones, with your parents. I think that's a great one. You can also go to my website, wendybolio.com. I also have uh, askwendyb.com. I think those are great. The other thing, too, that um, that I think when people are caregiving right now, Genworth did a study, and it's uh, you can get it on our, our 
website as well. It's called Beyond Dollars. It's a brand new study, our second one out, and it talks about, Neil, what we're talking about. It's sometimes it's, it's the, the dollars are there. Look, a, a, a caregiver of a family member is going to spend on average $11,000 a year out of their money paying for care for, for loved ones. Now, that's an average. But what I find with caregiving is people need, if they're in that situation, they need and need to have resources to go to. And I think some of those um, you can find on any website. Search, certainly the National Caregiving Association is a great site to go to um, because people in that situation need help. Absolutely. They need help locally, hospital-wise, people to talk to, um, those kinds of things, and that giving that kind of support I think is really important. Well, Wendy, thanks for calling the program. Uh, best of luck to you. We'll have to have you back on and talk more about your experiences in the Olympics and what you're doing after uh, and, and more questions, so we'll stay in touch. So thanks for calling. Okay, Neil, I know you're busy, but stay fit. All right, thanks a lot, Wendy. Take care. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. All right, you're listening to Education Celebrity Show on the Education Network. We'll be back in just a moment.